is a healthcare business podcast from the Coker Group that focuses on solutions to help healthcare organizations effectively navigate the changing healthcare industry landscape. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with Coker. My name is Mark Reibolt. I'm host of the podcast. And uh, we have an, another really good topic we're talking about today. We have a couple of guests joining us. Uh, one is a new guest for us here to the podcast. Um, so I want to welcome Rick Heineman. He is a an attorney with uh, the McDonald Hopkins law firm. He's based out of Chicago, but uh, McDonald Hopkins works with clients all over the country. Um, it has a very strong healthcare practice. We at Coker um, have done a lot of work alongside the attorneys there. So um, we appreciate Rick joining us. We also have with us uh, Andy Sobchett, who is one of the our team members here at Coker. And um, Andy does a lot of work with both medical practices and hospitals, particularly hospital employed groups on a wide range of uh, operations, financial work, um, strategy work, et cetera. And so um, I'm really pleased to have Rick and Andy here today. And and what we're talking about is something that's very timely, very relevant to our audience of providers and and folks in provider organizations like hospitals and medical groups. Um, And we're talking about surprise billing legislation, um, specifically No Surprises Act. And we're gonna get into the weeds of that here to a certain extent. Um, Before we jump in with Rick and Andy, I, I wanna mention a couple of quick things. One, um, I always like to say we, we appreciate everybody listening. Um, and not only can this podcast be found on the Coker website, but all of our podcast episodes can be found on the website. So you can go directly there, cokergroup.com. You can also find all those at coffeewithcoker.com. Um, please feel free to tune in, download, or, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, and with that, I, I do want to jump right in. Um, the the other thing I was going to say on this specific topic, you can find in the show notes links to a couple of supporting reference materials that may help folks that are interested in learning more about this. Um, Rick has done an article. Um, we'll make that available as as well. Andy has as well. And um, we'll make sure that both of those are available to everyone for additional information, because this is there's a lot of detail here. And when we're working through a 30 minute conversation, uh, it's it's pretty challenging to get into all the details of this and, and everything that relates to it. So. Uh, we realize we're going to be uh, covering this at a certain surface level, but uh, there is additional information out there. And obviously, for folks that need uh, more questions answered or additional information, we always uh, recommend reaching out to um, our, our guests, our experts here. And so um, we'll make sure contact information for Rick and Andy are available. You guys can feel free to reach out to them. Um, with that, um, I would want to um, jump right in. So. Rick, first of all, thanks for joining. And if you don't mind, start off just talking about, well, give us give us kind of a rundown of what we are talking about as far as the surprise billing legislation and, and the, the kind of act itself, but, uh, you know, why it's relevant. Thanks, Mark. The, uh, the No Surprises Act uh, was enacted in December 2020 as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And it, it was one of the rare examples in, 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 rec- in recent history in uh, Washington where, where you had truly bipartisan legislation. Um, the, the No Surprises Act is, was, was intended to protect patients from uh, surprise medical bills and to set forth a, a, a process to determine payment amounts by the, the patient and also the, uh, the health plan or insurer for out-of-network uh, services. The, the, the No Surprises Act was in response to um, yeah, a number of uh, incidents where uh, uh, patients were caught in the middle of payment disputes between payers and out-of-network providers and suffered financially due to, due to surprise medical bills. Uh, and so uh, in terms of a surprise medical bill, a common scenario yeah, involves an insured patient who schedules a procedure. Uh, for example, it could be a surgery, schedules a procedure at a facility such as a hospital, 
and uh, you have plans to have the, the procedure done by a physician and checks and make sure that the hospital and physician are both participating within the um, within the, the managed care network, the PPO network for the health plan. And so the patient thinks that uh, he or she is going to be able to minimize out-of-pocket costs and get in-network rates. And uh, there, there are a lot of people who can get involved in the process uh, yeah, besides the, the hospital and the facility. And for example, unbeknownst to the patient, an out-of-network provider can become involved in providing services such as an anesthesiologist or a radiologist or some specialist physician. And the patient then can get saddled with an out-of-network out of network rates and also cost sharing amounts. It can be well in excess of what the um, what the uh, patient was was expecting. So, so the, the the legislation, the No Surprises Act, is it really addressed, fully designed to address that type of situation. And they also have some protection for for uninsured and uh, self pay patients as well. Uh, so the the No Surprises Act has as significant implications for a lot of healthcare providers and facilities, as well as health plans and insurers and, and certainly patients. For our discussion today, we're going to be focusing our attention on implications and action steps for, for healthcare providers and facilities, as, as well as the billing and revenue cycle management companies that work with providers. I appreciate that. Rick, that that overview, um, because I mean, you between you and Andy, you guys are definitely the the subject matter experts here, and and um, experts on this this whole kind of evolving situation. I, I wanted to make the point that you know this is something very uh, actionable and and meaningful as far as relevancy for for our mutual clients, uh, the, the, the clients we work with, the organizations we work with. And, and it's something that requires some obviously attention, but, you know, I think some due diligence and which is kind of why we're talking about it. Right. But it is definitely one of those things that it's not just, you know, may be on the radar for, for our clients, but it, it for sure is on not only on the radar, but is going to have an impact on them. And, and, and so I appreciate you kind of going through that, uh, that rundown of what it even is. And, and what I think we want to talk about now is why it's relevant. Um, if, it, if it's not obvious, but um, more importantly, perhaps, is or what do we do about it if, if we are trying to understand it and determine what action needs to be taken? Um, you mentioned, Rick, we're, we're really talking about from the perspective of, of our audience and, and our clients that, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the providers here, we're, you know, providers and provider organizations. Andy, if you don't mind, maybe jump in and talk about kind of who else is impacted here and and how and and you know uh, why it's meaningful as far as you know being on the radar for these organizations. Absolutely. Um, well, I think just to put it briefly, it's meaningful because it's impacting the business of a big chunk of providers out there. Um, there, there are a lot of providers that do you know, rely on out of network billing. Some of them mm -hmm. choose to do so because they can collect better rates uh, when they do that. Um, you know, there was a health affairs article that studied this on just emergency physicians. And over the course of that study, which is, you know, years long, those physicians collected about 65% of the charged amount for those scenarios where there was a surprise bill versus just 50 to 52% for all their other cases. You know those numbers could lead to healthier margins for those mm -hmm. physicians. You know it's 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 pretty razor thin when you're operating your own practice. And so um, legislation like this, um, while it's it's great for patients, and I think we can all agree it it is the right thing to do. It shifts you know the the burden of the cost uh, back to the providers more and, and the insurers in some cases to where you know they'll now be forced to determine if if those out of network rates are you know appropriate or they need to be higher uh, and and so on. Um, just in terms of the impact on patients, you know there there have been studies done on this. you know not a lot can have quantified the total dollar value of these visits because it is kind of difficult to pinpoint them. But you know about one in five uh, emergency department visits you know can result in a surprise bill. That's the number that's that's out there on a lot of the the government resources. Um, those balances, you know, could cost patients up to about $600 more per visit. 
Uh, and just on the emergency physician side, you know, that same health affairs article estimated they collect about $64 million a year in additional revenue just from those particular visits. And so the, the practices that have to act um, as a result of this legislation will have to do so in a number of manners. Um, it, it is going to force you know, practices and providers to provide more transparent notices to patients, more consents to patients before these services are provided. If they're not emergent, obviously, if you're in the emergency department, you don't have a lot of time to consent. Um, but uh, it bans practices from balance billing in those emergency situations. And so there's just a lot of considerations, both administrative and financial, for practices to, you know, to really start acting on now uh, to mitigate some of these impacts. Um, you know, in some situations, that revenue may not come back. I mean, that may just be gone to where, you know, that, that out-of-network rate was way too high. You know the the new rate that's going to be determined between the providers and the insurers may be much lower, and those practices are going to have to adjust to uh, a, a world where their revenues are just going to be lower as a result of this. It, it may actually push some waste out of the system. Mm. Yeah, I mean, significant financial impact, I have to think, I, I, and then that flows into a number of other things as well. Rick, if you don't mind, walk us through you know, to the extent that you haven't already covered some of these takeaways, key takeaways, I would say, in your in your overview and intro. But what else from a in terms of the legislation itself or should people be aware of and thinking about? Yeah. And and the um the the No Surprises Act and the surprise billing regulations have have a lot of implications and 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 create a lot of responsibilities and 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 issues for for healthcare providers and their their billing companies and Andy already mentioned the the, the financial implications. There there are a lot of nuts and bolts issues to to think about where providers need to to post notices and disclosures on their website. They need to have notices at at their facilities. They need to to, to furnish notices to patients. One of the things that I think is really important for for hospital-based physicians to keep in mind and the physicians like pathologists or radiologists, anesthesiologists, emergency physicians, is that there, there are provisions within the um, within the surprise billing regulations that require notices going to patients. And these are notices that go to all of the insured patients, even if they're they're in network. Um, and there, there are, are provisions within the regulations that allow the physician group to rely on the hospital, for example, to provide the notices. But there, there, there's an important caveat to that, which is, which is that if you look under the regulations, the regulations say they can rely on, the physician can rely on the hospital to, to do the notice if the hospital agrees in writing to do that. And um, um, that's one of the things that for the hospital-based practices, again, the pathologists, radiologists, anesthesiologists, emergency physicians, you know, should, should, be, should be thinking about whether they have some kind of written agreement from the, from the hospital to provide those notices so that, so that these group practices can rely on it. And, and there's also, there, there, there are model notices available on, the, um, on the, the HHS and CMS websites describe some of the notices that are required. And yeah, the providers and their billing companies also need to take care to implement, have policies and procedures in place to um, determine when the surprise billing restrictions apply and to, to meet the, the tight deadlines and requirements to, to contest payment. And, and then you also have, have uh, strategic and tactical issues. It changes, the, as Andy suggested, it, it already, it, it potentially changes the dynamics, who's going to be participating and, you know, yeah, health plans and you know, payers are going to be uh, probably changing changing how the, how they negotiate. Physicians need to think about it. There could be yeah, physicians and and other providers need to think about whether they need to have other types of other types of alignment, for example. So th those are on kind of a on kind of a high level. Those are some of the issues, and th there are some more more specific issues we can talk about as well. Absolutely. Well, that's helpful because there is, there's a lot to it. And um, it would take a while to get into all of the nuances of this, but there's a lot here that's very relevant. Andy, Coker does a lot of work on, on rev cycle assistance, optimization, et cetera, um, helping with, you know, clients deal with various billing issues or, or billing, you know, processes. 
through this, are there certain payment categories that are affected or how so? Yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's an important question. I mean, it's essentially any scenario where there's a, a balanced bill. So if a provider is providing care and they are out of network and they're providing it at an in-network facility, you know, they would bill the patient their full amount. Um, the insurance, you know, typically would only cover the allowable. But then that provider could go back to the patient for the remaining, the difference amount. That's that's the balance of the bill. They won't be able to do that anymore. It's completely, you know, banned under the legislation for those emergency services. Uh, other services that are non emergent in the hospital setting, you know, they, they could still do it, but it would have to be under very specific categories as outlined in the legislation. And they would have to provide the appropriate consents, but also the appropriate good faith estimates as the legislation states. And so a lot more transparency around that. There are some practices that may be doing that, you know, those that are already providing these out of network services and choosing to do so. They probably have those processes in place because patients likely wouldn't choose to go there you know if, if they didn't have that in place uh, but there are others that may not and so that that takes a lot of work to to come up with those estimates for each and every patient and to do it in a timely manner you know I think it's you know under the legislation there are time frames under which they have to provide those estimates to patients uh, I believe it's within 72 hours uh, is that right Rick I think I think that was one of the examples they gave if an appointment was made uh, within a, a time frame. Yeah, it, it 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 depends on what the timing is in terms of how um, how far ahead the uh, the appointment is scheduled, and, and and another important issue there is whether it's an uninsured or self pay a self pay patient. I mean the um the requirement to to, to provide a, a good faith estimate. Um, there are provisions within the statute that apply that require that both for insured and uninsured patients. But for for the insured patients, the um the agencies have recognized that there's that they're, they're essentially not enforcing that yet. But but they are. Are enforcing the the regulations are in place requiring a good faith estimate um, you know, for, for for an uninsured patient or 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 a self pay patient and so one of the things that a practice needs to do a provider needs to do is to have processes in place so 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 they can determine who's who's covered by insurance who's uninsured is it a self pay patient so maybe it's even a an insured patient who may may be self pay and then there's there's uh, requirements to uh, yeah, to give to give a good faith estimate, and th th there's really a lot more, a lot of detail here that that we don't really have have time to to get into, and that there's notices that need to be required that are required, and some of these notices and disclosures are are apply to insured patients, and some of them apply to you know, uninsured and self pay patients, and then there's also notice requirements if there's if there's a situation where a provider um, wants to wants to balance bill the patient and get the patient's consent to do that, and in order to, to and there's there's limited categories of services where that's where that's allowed, and so so the provider really needs to to have policies in place to and and processes in place to determine uh, when when the No Surprises Act applies. And in some cases, state law may apply too. If, if state law has a right. balanced billing um, restriction, then then uh, then in, in many cases that, that that's what's going to apply. And it gets even more complicated because because even if there's a state a state uh, uh, balance billing prohibition, yeah, you know, th that that's going to apply to some payers, some health plans, and not others. If it's a an ERISA, a, a self insured plan, for example, that's not going to be covered by the state plan. So you can have some claims that may be covered by the No Surprises Act and some by the state act. And that state act, that's just a whole other layer in there too, where you know, depending on where your practice is or facility lies, you may have to understand those state laws and they differ state to state. Uh, looks like there's about 33 states that have some laws in place to protect, you know, patients from balance billing. Those protect patients uh, in different degrees. And so it's really for the practices, it's, it's a lot of work to understand exactly what they have to do and how they have to to be compliant in, in this kind of new world um, for, for these particular services. Uh, in addition to understanding the state you know, laws and all the other implications of the act with respect to notices and all those things. 
there's the, the process of, of actual payment and then the dispute resolution, which uh, I think is another big topic, you know, that we wanted to try to cover here um, as it relates to providers and insurers negotiating now what the new appropriate rate should be if, if that provider can't balance bill for that out of network rate. Uh, and just to kind of, you know, draw attention to something that we have in, in the uh, Coker blog post from, from last year, we kind of modeled out a scenario um, just for an emergency visit. Uh, it's kind of a basic level three visit. But if you look at it, you know, the, the provider that bills out of network under the previous environment would be able to collect you know, almost $650 from that visit. Uh, whereas, you know, now with the insurance allowable at only like 251 or so, they lose about $400 on that visit. If that provider doesn't, you know, agree with that insurance allowable, then they would have to go to the insurance company to dispute it through this new independent dispute resolution process, which is laid out in, in the law. And the issue with it, or at least the issue that the providers have with it right now is that that process, you know, it's pretty compressed. It's only about 30 days, uh, for them to go back and forth on this. And then if they are to escalate this negotiation to somebody that's going to be an arbiter, uh, they're, the law is essentially telling or, or, or mandating that those individuals use this uh, QPA or qualified payment amount. Um, and, and a lot of times, or really in the legislation, it's saying that that amount is going to be the median rate uh, for that geography. And so, you know, if that median rate is is really low uh, or just not acceptable to the practice, there really isn't much they can do as the law is written right now. And so a lot of the pushback on the provider side is that this is going to take a lot of money out of their pockets and they may not have a whole lot to do about it as the law is written. You know, what they may do in the future is you may see a lot of these, you know, providers um, start to align more closely with hospitals, health systems, larger networks that can get rates within their plans uh, that are higher than that median rate. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, they may, they may be stuck with it if, if those particular lawsuits on the provider side don't uh, affect the law as it stands today. Actually, I want to come back to that because that's something that I think we need to, to to have some more dialogue around as far as the response. Before we do that, what in terms of the, the dispute resolution process, it's still very early on in this. Even you know, it hasn't been that long since the legislation uh, came about, and then when it's been effective. Uh, not ton of time, but has there been any escalation of these disputes to you know litigation or lawsuits or anything like that 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 we're aware of? Well, there 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 is some some litigation where some uh, some associations have have, have challenged um, the regulations and the uh, big point of contention, as Andy mentioned, is that there's you know, within the regulations there's a presumption. Um, you know, for this independent dispute resolution. And I do want to want to kind of come back to the independent dispute resolution in a few minutes as well. But th there's basically a presumption within the regulations that says that this qualifying payment amount is 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 essentially presumed to be what the appropriate rate is. And the qualified the, the qualifying payment amount is essentially an amount that's calculated to approximate what that particular uh, health plan or or insurers median uh, contracted rate is so so yeah so so particularly if you have a situation where a um, a provider may not be participating if, if, at least in part because they think the in network rates are too low that they in effect could get forced to accept what are pretty close to those um, th th those in network rates so so there's some uh, so some uncertainty as to what we'll have to see what happens with the litigation, but but unless the litigation prevails and there is some or you know or the other possibility is these are interim final rules, so the agencies could conceivably come back and and change the rules. I don't know if they will, but the, that that that's a possibility. Um, but yeah, but to kind of to go back maybe to what this independent dispute resolution process is, it's basically a. Uh, a, a similar to a baseball style arbitration. So the 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 structure is that the provider bills the 
bills to pay or bills a health plan or insurer, the health plan or insurer sends sends a payment amount and they're not required to send a specific amount, but they send a payment amount. And then the um, and then as Andy mentioned, you've got very tight time frame here, time frames here. The um, the, um, the 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 provider has 30 business days to come back to the payer and and negotiate a different rate and then and then they have like another 30 day 30 business 30 business days for the um for a negotiation period and then if they still don't get if the provider's not happy with the rate then then they have four business days after that period uh you know, to to file for this independent dispute resolution so 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 and, and that um that's to even get the independent dispute resolution process started, and th- and then you've you've got some very tight timeframes in terms of in terms of the parties of agreeing on who that the the, the arbitrator is going to be the independent dispute resolution uh, entity, and also also to 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 make a proposal as as to what the rate is uh, should be and and supporting materials, which is one of the reasons it's really important for providers to have have systems in place to be able to to, uh, to to flag situations where the no surprises act applies and very quickly d- determine whether whether it's worthwhile to go through the negotiation process and also the um, the independent dispute resolution process that, that's very helpful and what what other key dates should our listeners uh, be aware of as far as because I, I have to think with those short timelines and, you know, when you think about, well, even it didn't have to be a large organization, but I, I, in particular, think about a, a, an employed hospital, employed medical group that's having to deal with potentially a lot of these, a lot of different things that has to be addressed. Just some of the things, Rick, that you just walked through. What, what other kind of time frame should we be uh, informed about? Well, those those kind of th- th- those thirty business day day periods to start the negotiation and also to uh, uh, to start the independent dispute resolution process are are big. Keep keeping in mind that that if a provider doesn't come in and challenge the rate, they're probably going to get stuck with whatever whatever the payer pays, and yeah, you know, you know the, the payers presumably you know, are, are going to be offering relatively low low payment amounts, at least compared to what the um, a provider wants and and then yeah we also mentioned also there's these uh, notific these notice and disclosure requirements to provide the good faith estimate so we we already touched base on that but th- there's a very a, a very quick uh, turnaround period in terms of getting that information out to the patient particularly if it's a self pay or uh, self pay or self or uninsured patient Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, Andy, I want to circle back briefly to you talked earlier a little bit about the financial impact. Obviously, there's there, there could be significant financial impact here. You guys talked about the the potential for different rates and and the dispute resolution process and kind of what ultimately comes out of that. But I, I could see just knowing to a certain degree the ins and outs of Billing offices and and or these organizations in terms of their operations, talk a little bit more if you don't mind about some of the the financial considerations here and and also, you know, perhaps even more importantly, what can be done to either deal with the impact, absorb the impact, or mitigate it entirely. I think that's the question a lot of these you know, providers that are affected are going to be asking. Um, you look at the specialties that do the out of network billing the most. Um, you know, it's, it's the ones you would expect. Um, at least the top ones, the emergency physicians, uh, about half of, of those, you know, bill out of network, at least to some degree. That doesn't mean half, you know, bill all of their services out of network. Um, but pathology, radiology, anesthesiology, behavioral health. Uh, and even like cardiovascular physicians and, and others that, that perform surgeries um, have some type of out of net billing within their kind of national provider profile. Uh, the ones that do it the most are the emergency and pathology physicians. Um, you know, there's um, an article that we kind of reference in our blog post that, that provides some of these breakdowns. Uh, it's uh, from the Healthcare Cost Institute. They, they provided something back in 2020 that showed a breakdown of all these specialties and the degree to which they bill out of network. 
Um, the ones below the emergency and pathology physicians don't do it as much. But if you're looking at just the emergency physicians, I mentioned in that one scenario where it's just like a level three emergency visit, could be up to $400 that the provider loses out on there. Now that assumes they collect all of the applicable revenue, probably don't do that. But let's assume that they do. Uh, just a provider performing at the median of you know what we would consider you know benchmark range, you know that could be up to one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year in revenue opportunity that they lose. Um, now, depending on how effective they are collecting revenue in general, it could be more or less than that. But you know anything over one hundred thousand dollars for a private practice you know, on a per physician level, that could be catastrophic. Uh, and so, you know what they could do uh, to mitigate that would would be try to be in network, uh, try to get in network and, you know, don't, you know, just bill out of network for, for that portion of, you know, their practice and, um, attempt to, you know, get rates that are going to be higher than that median amount. Um, that's basically going to be kind of forced on them in the way the law is written now. Uh, now that may be easier said than done. You know, obviously, if it's just one practice and they're trying to go about it themselves, they're they're likely not going to get great rates on their own. So you you could see some of these practices be absorbed by larger health systems, you know, or other kind of you know medical group conglomerates, whether it's a private equity funded, you know, route or anything of that nature. So you you could see this driving more of that consolidation in these practices that previously have been doing okay on their own uh, in this environment, but but now that that kind of changes their their economics and you know they're there may not be a return to those out of network rates under this legislation. I, I think it's hard to imagine that the insurance companies would be pushed to bring their in network rates up to those previous out of network levels, especially when the gap was so large before. They may, they may close it a little bit, but it may not be enough for a lot of practices. And so I think in terms of mitigating strategies, obviously they have to make sure they're compliant with the law put all these administrative processes uh, and policies in place uh, so that they, when they do it and, and if they can do it compliantly, they, they make sure they capture that. Uh, but they, they need to plan on losing a lot of that revenue and, and trying to figure out whether or not controlling costs or other sources of revenue can make up for it. And if not, uh, as I mentioned, you, you may see some of these practices start to look for partners. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we because uh, I wanted to circle back to that. And I'm, so I'm glad you did, Andy. And, and you know, I, I absolutely could see just looking at the financial impact that as the response, meaning um, looking for partners, whether, like you said, it's uh, you know affiliation with the health system or like it's like a private equity sponsor or platform company that's that's rolling up groups, whatever it may be uh, groups that historically have been just fine uh, operating independently, uh, you know, may start to consider these these uh, options a little more seriously. The, the other thing, though, is it's not just the finance, the direct financial impact of the billing, but just dealing with this as the uh, burden and, and quite frankly, the hassle of of these types of obligations continue to escalate and grow and be added on, whether it's through legislation or, or some other mechanism uh, in public policy, I think may, and, and I guess this is my question to, to you, Andy and Rick, is, is, it, is it just becoming too onerous to, um, to, to deal with all of this? And, and, and you know, this isn't the only thing, right? It seems like there's something else every year, maybe even more often than that. But I mean, is, is that driving that consideration for affiliation or some sort of alternative beyond just the, the financial impact, the rates themselves. Well, Ed, yeah, yeah. I think that this, this, this is a really important you know, issue in terms of the strategic uh, kind of impact. And yeah, I think it's still early, probably too early to, to really know what all, what all the, what all the impacts are going to be. And I think that this, um, this presumption toward the uh, median yeah, in-network rate being the being the the independent dispute resolution rates a a huge factor because if if that if that stays in place the um, uh, payers may have may have a, a, an incentive to, to to limit their their in-network uh, uh, groups to those that are 
that are willing to accept their low rates because that, that's that's the rate that's going to have an impact. Now, there, there's a about a three year lag period between like the, the, the rates that we're looking at right now are, are actually from 2019 and, and adjusted for for inflation. But so it might take a little while to have an impact. But, um, you yeah, know, payers very, very well might decide that that. Yeah, yeah, that they want to uh, um, contract with fewer groups, or or it, it, it's also possible maybe maybe they see a good opportunity to have good relationships. We don't we don't really know. And and then but 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 you you just have in terms of we've talked a lot, we've mentioned several times the policies and procedures and having systems in place. Um, the the providers need to need to have systems in place so that they can. They can make sure they're getting paid what what they're supposed to get paid, and yeah, yeah, even even if it has to be that 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 uh, qualifying payment amount um, that may be that may be higher in some cases to, to what they're getting paid initially, and so they need to have systems, and also they need to have systems in place and policies and procedures to just to comply with the notice and disclosure requirements. If if, if they don't. If they could be subject to fines, they they could be subject to penalties for not for not doing that. Um, that's in addition to the financial impact that we're talking about in terms of the rates they're getting paid. So there's even additional inherent risk potentially that could come beyond just just the rates. I want to bring this full circle. We talked about what it is, and we talked about why it's meaningful. Um, again, there's a lot to this, so um, we've only covered it at a relatively higher level. I, I want to make it meaningful and, and and specifically relevant for our audience and, and our clients. But you know, what are some of the things that where you can start? And you know, obviously, Andy, you talked about the uh, covering going through the administrative process of the the consents and notices and and it, all of those types of things that need to occur um what about though in terms of if if i am a if i'm someone responsible for the financial performance of our group um and and trying to understand this a little bit better particularly rick to your point and the fact that we're dealing with the three year lag in terms of the actual figures, can we, is there anything we can do to, to kind of understand or get an understanding of the potential impact of something like this? I mean, I know it's hard to forecast what's going to be disputed and those types of things, but um, as far as planning and strategically as well as tactically for even just this year, um, as, as we're thinking about 2022, you know, what can we do to start understanding that impact? And then what else can we or should we be doing if, if, if I am that organization thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, if I'm sitting in that position within a practice that's affected, you know, whether it's emergency, pathology, radiology, you know, whatever it is. Um, first, you know, I, I would feel very uh, pressed to understand the legislation uh, to, to really get into the weeds of it. And there's summaries all over the place for it. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Rick and his team put together a really great one from last year. Um, you know, the article and the blog post we put out has a little bit of it in there, but I, I'd say really get your arms around that and understand the requirements for notices, the requirements for the dispute process, um, you know, and, and all the services that are, uh, impacted, you know, not just the emergency services, but the non-emergency services in the hospitals that are going to be uh, impacted by the legislation, then you probably want to understand how much your practice is, um, is, is billing at a network. You know, what percent of your, your current volume is going to be quote unquote affected or at risk, um, under this new, um, under these new rules. Uh, and then, you know, do, do a little bit of a financial analysis, whether, whether you could do that yourself or, you know, you work with folks on our team or, you know, whoever you would want to get your arms around what that, um, what the potential, you know, uh, revenue risk is uh, ahead of you. And then start thinking about how you can mitigate that as, as we kind of discussed previously. Uh, you know, is it, uh, you know, can we mitigate it by just going in network? Uh, is that gonna, you know, help close the gap and, 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 and make us still profitable? Can we mitigate it by 
being, you know, more effective at collecting revenue uh, on our other services that are in network and, you know, in our, you know, practice walls, you know, can we improve, you know, the practice in that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're really going to have to try to um, squeeze a little more juice out of the lemon, uh, so to speak, uh, if that financial impact is large and, and a big chunk of your services are going to be affected by this. Yeah, which which you can't you can't get that additional squeeze um, if you don't understand to begin with kind of what you're dealing with. Um, right. And and also to your earlier point, you know, is the just understanding the impact of going in network on on some of these things is a an assessment in and of itself um because like you said andy i, I believe you you mentioned that you know that that may be an alternative that may be an option but it may not be a good option um and for some it may not be an option so i think you know that's probably one of those early on things we got to understand um rick as far as bringing it full circle and 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 you know conclusions here what are some of the things that you're telling clients when they have questions about this how are you beyond maybe what what andy went through as far as um how to tackle this or, or where to start what are some of the things you're recommending to clients as far as understanding and then um, planning for this well, I, th- I think I think it, I think it depends a lot on what the the circumstances for for a particular for a provider, for example, and and, and I thought that Andy made it made a lot of good points about the the importance of kind of monitoring things and figuring out where things are and what the alternatives are. I mean, for for uh, uh, some groups, like they they could depending on what the types of services are, um, some providers may be able to. Um, to get the patient consent and and to and to balance bill, although although I think very often I think that's pro- that's that that very often could be difficult uh, because there there are so many limitations on on uh, pretty much that the usual categories of types of services are not allowed uh, yeah to to fit within that and yeah, even if it's a situation where there's no network provider available. Um, you know, so I think it may be difficult to, to bill, you know, to, to be able to, to get consent and, and balance bill, although that that's possible for, it may, it may be for some types of practices that, that may be possible. And really the, um, the uh, big thing I think is to, is to understand what the situations are to understand when the no surprises act applies, is, is there a state law? So, so that may, maybe the state law may, may provide more or, or less favorable circumstances and uh, um, certainly do the best you can to get, to get paid what you can. And so if, if a group's letting the, the 30, 30 business days elapse after getting the the EOB and the um you know, the, the initial payment there yeah they may be precluded from um, from getting paid anymore even if they may be paid even even less than what the um the allowed rate would be if they go to in a, in a dispute resolution so so I, I think it's really important to be able to have processes out there yeah, to uh, make sure that they're doing what they're required to do in terms of of, of giving the notices and, and disclosures, so at least they don't have to worry about getting fined, getting penalties, and you know, also to um, you know to monitor what's going on and be able to negotiate, and then and then pursue the independent dispute resolution process to the extent that they can. Those may not be um, yeah, big picture answers in terms of getting them. Uh, yeah, the rates that so, that some of the providers may have historically been been getting, but I, th- yeah, I think that that's that's uh, uh, that's a good start. And for some for some groups, that that may be pretty much the main thing that they can do. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Rick. And you know, one of the things when when we're working with clients on on really anything like this, but you know, we we Coker can do a lot as far as getting in the weeds of, of assessing of the, the fin- potential financial impact and um, understanding both strategic and tactical uh, implications for in- an individual organization that has their own unique characteristics and, and scenarios that they have to ultimately address. Um, but oftentimes, there's there's the compliance element here. Um, you know, really every time we're dealing with something like this, there's a compliance piece here where 
beyond just a basic understanding of what's included and the timing of different things. But, you know, us, our suggestion is always to, you know, as you're thinking about the financial impact here, you got to think about this from a compliance standpoint, um, consulting with their legal counsel that is familiar with this specifically. And, you know, those, like you guys mentioned a couple of times, the, the state laws that are involved here, if there's 30 plus states that have these, um, you know, these types of restrictions or this type of legislation on their books, and you're also dealing with the federal piece and then, you know, everything else that kind of comes along down the pipe that you guys have covered here, that, you know, those are questions that I think need to be addressed early and, and very specifically or things that need to be understood beyond just the, the, the legislation itself. And, you know, I can't recommend good qualified legal counsel enough for our clients because um, the last thing you want, right, is this coming back to, to bite them in some way, whether it's through fines or other you know, issues that come up from a compliance perspective down the road. So, um, you know, I think there are different elements here that need to be considered. They're, they certainly overlap and they certainly, they aren't mutually exclusive of each other, but I think there's a lot of understanding that needs to be um, a, a accomplished in order to ultimately determine what those next steps or initial steps uh, could or should be. Would you, would you all agree? Yeah, man, there, there's, there are really a lot of factors for, uh, uh, you know, providers and other parties to be, to be thinking about here. And I think, I think it's kind of hard to, to just kind of, there are so many issues out there that I think it needs to be kind of each uh, uh, provider needs to be kind of, kind of look at, look at a customized approach to see what works for them. And, you know, one of the, uh, the, the points that Andy's raised or, and, and I think you both raised is, is, um, uh, the, the possibility of uh, uh, different affiliations in the future, whether it's like what, what, whether it's alignment with other providers, whether it's whether it's uh, trying to um, uh, to get in network with more health plans or um, yeah you know, through through IPA type of, of arrangements or um, um, otherwise. Yeah, yeah, and and there are probably a lot of those. I mean, I, I know um, this while this affects every provider organization, well, for the most part, that have, that's within those uh, affected specialties and categories, um, the, the specific impact is going to vary, obviously, and by organization. And I think that's something that, that where the understanding, um, the, the specific applicability for that organization becomes even more acute because, you know, it, it, it may be, again, it may be a, Going in network is is the route, but it's hard to say that's the the best route if we haven't considered the others and obviously the impact of that. So um, I think that's that makes a lot of sense as far as where we're working alongside our clients and and Rick. I know you guys are as well. So um, th this has been extremely helpful. I know we've we've tried to cover a lot in a relatively short span of time. Um, again, as I've I've said a couple of times, there is a lot to get into here that we could get into here to really understand not just the le legislation, but the impact on provider organizations. Um, and so as, as I'm sure our listeners can imagine, um, there's, there's, there's a lot here that, uh, that requires further dialogue, further research and due diligence, and then ultimately assessing the, the individual impact. But for now, I, I really appreciate this conversation, the additional information that you guys have put together, Rick, um, your articles and Andy, what you guys, your team has put together. Um, again, we'll make sure that's stuff is available, but I, I would really suggest folks that are dealing with this, that could be impacted by this to, to reach out to Rick and or Andy or anybody, certainly on our team, um, for you know, understanding a little bit more in depth, uh, get the questions answered and, and perhaps even kind of look into, uh, you know, what ultimately, uh, the, the specific impact on your organization could, could be. Um, but in the meantime, I, I know this won't be the last time we talk about this. This is something that's going to be ongoing. Rick, to your earlier point, that may be something that, uh, you know, ultimately entails additional changes or elements to the, the legislation and the, the policy itself. So um, thank you guys for going through this and we'll look forward to checking back in and, and maybe getting kind of an update on, on some of the things that uh, that's happening and some of the things we're doing with clients around this. But uh, in the meantime, thank you guys and look forward to talking more in the future. 
Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Coffee with Coker, and we thank you for listening. We want to encourage all of our listeners to participate and contribute in the podcast. Uh, So if you have any questions uh, on any of the things we discussed in this episode, any of the topics that were presented, please feel free to ask us. Also, we welcome your feedback and suggestions. If you have any ideas uh, related to the, the material we discussed in this episode, or again, or in any episode, please let us know and we'll make sure to incorporate it. And if you have ideas for topics you'd like to hear more information about in future episodes, please send those suggestions to us. We'd love to hear them and we'd love to incorporate them into our future episodes. Uh, You can find us online and on social media. Start with our website and specifically the podcast is coffeewithcoker.com. You can also find that through the main Coker website at cokergroup.com. You can also find us on social media, Twitter at Coker Group. And then on LinkedIn, you can search for Coker Group and find our page and and the page for uh, some of our team members as well there. So you can find us and reach out to us a number of places. And then if you want to contact us directly, one of the best ways to do that, email feedback at cokergroup.com. That's feedback at cokergroup.com. And again, we'd love to get your feedback. And we'd love to encourage everyone to subscribe to the podcast so that you can be notified when future episodes are released. Uh, We look forward to uh, the next episode and we look forward to getting your suggestions and feedback on this episode. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to speaking with you again on future episodes.